Okay, so this is going to be Mrs. T's Chem Talk on Regions Review. We're going to learn a little bit about the reference tables today and hopefully make sure that we know what we're doing for when the regions comes along for the different tables. This is what the front of your reference table will look like. It's the table, the 2011 edition. I'm going to start with table A. Table A is standard temperature and pressure. And on table A, we have standard temperature and pressure, which is abbreviated with STP. Anytime a question says STP, the question is referring to the conditions on table A. For example, if we're talking about standard pressure, we're talking about 101.3 kilopascals, which is also equal to one atmosphere. Depending on which unit you need to use, you can use 101.3 kilopascals or one atmosphere. Now those two values are equal to each other, and if we want to convert between kilopascals and atmospheres, we multiply atmospheres times 101.3, and that will give us kilopascals. So any amount in atmospheres times 101.3 will give us the equivalent value in the unit kilopascals. For standard temperature, that value is either 273 if we're talking about kelvins or 0 degrees in Celsius. Those are equal to each other. And we have the formula on table T, kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273 if we need to convert between kelvin and Celsius. You also might see STP mentioned in the combined gas law problems, P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. And if it mentions STP, you're going to look up the values of STP. Always use 273 Kelvin and use whichever unit for pressure fits into the problem, whichever unit is mentioned on the other part of the problem. The next place that we're going to go is to table B. Table B has our physical constants of water on it, and we're going to use these usually um, along with the heat problems from table T. When heat is mentioned and it's regarding water, we're going to use these values. Heat of fusion is used in the problem in the value Q equals MHF. Heat of vaporization is used in the formula Q equals MHV. And specific heat capacity is used in the formula Q equals MC delta T. Heat of fusion is defined as the amount of heat it takes to melt one gram of a substance at its melting point. For water, that value is 334 joules per gram. We're going to use heat of fusion for water when we're talking about melting. When the question talks about freezing, when the question talks about going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. We're going to use heat of vaporization when we are talking about going from liquid to gas, gas to liquid, or boiling or condensing. And this is defined as the amount of heat it takes to boil or vaporize one gram of a substance at its boiling point. <clears throat> So that's boiling, condensing, liquid to gas, and gas to liquid. For water, the value is 2,260 joules per gram. For specific heat capacity, we're going to use this whenever there is a temperature change. That's what the delta T in Q equals MC delta T means. And if we're talking about water experiencing a temperature change, we're going to use the value 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin for the C value, which is the specific heat capacity. And again, we only use these values for water. There is a chance that if heat was asked about for a substance that's not water, we need to use different values and we need to look for that in the question. We notice that the heat of fusion is lower than the heat of vaporization, and that's because it takes much more energy 
in order to overcome the complete intermolecular forces to go from liquid to gas than it does to go from solid to liquid, which only overcomes some of the intermolecular force. Table C, which is selected prefixes, will help us to convert between units that have different prefixes. So if we're talking about kilo, for example, 10 to the third is equal to kilo, which has the abbreviation K. And what that means is that one kilogram is equal to 10 to the third grams, which is the same thing as saying that one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. If we want to talk about milli, 10 to the minus three is the prefix for milli, and that's the, the abbreviation M. That means that one milliliter is equal to 10 to the minus three liters, which means that one milliliter is equal to 0 0.001 liters, and that might help us in order to convert between milliliters and liters, or kilo, kilograms and grams. Table D helps us with selected units. If you want to know what type of value is being measured, you can look up a unit on table D. For example, if you have a value and you don't know what the unit means, you have something that's measured in joules, like maybe 67.2 J, you can look up the J on table D and see that J stands for joule. And so we're measuring a quantity of energy, amount of work, or a quantity of heat. The next place we're going to go is to table E which is the selected polyatomic ions. And when we look at table E, we are going to use table E when finding the charges of the polyatomic ions in a formula in order to find oxidation states, or when finding crisscross formulas for a polyatomic ion. So for example, if you have the formula FeSO4, And you can pretty much figure out that oxygen is a negative two oxidation state, but sulfur and iron both have more than one choice on the table and you're not really sure where to go with that. What you're going to do is look up sulfate on the table and you start from the charge, the overall charge of sulfate to find the charges of the other species in the formula. So I look at SO4 and I see that SO4 has an overall charge of negative two. That means that the S and the four O's will have to have a total charge of negative two. And whatever number the sulfur is, whatever its overall charge is, will have to go together with the total charge of negative eight for the oxygen in order to add up to a negative two. So the number that does that is a positive six. I divide by my understood, sub, understood subscript of one on the way back up, and that gives me an oxidation number of positive six for the sulfur. I can also use this to do crisscross formulas. For example, if I need to find the formula of magnesium phosphate, I'm going to look up magnesium on the periodic table, which has an oxidation number of positive two, and I'm going to look up phosphate on table E, and I see that it's a PO4, and it has an overall charge of negative three. I put it in parentheses because polyatomics need parentheses when crisscrossing. I crisscross my oxidation numbers and charges and, cross and drop the signs. I get Mg3, PO4 in parentheses two. When looking at table F, table F can help us to find out if a compound will dissolve in water and be soluble, or if it will be insoluble and not dissolve in water. And we're going to look and see that it has two sides. One side is the ions that form soluble compounds. The other side is the ions that generally form insoluble compounds. And we're going to look at a formula and try to find it first in the first column on each side. 
So if we want to do that magnesium phosphate, which we just found, we're going to look for magnesium and we're going to look for phosphate on the first side of each half. So the first column of each half. I don't see magnesium anywhere in the first columns, but I do see that phosphate is in the first column where it says that it usually forms insoluble compounds. The next thing I do is look for what else is in the compound and see if magnesium is one of phosphate's exceptions. And when I look at the exceptions, magnesium is not a group one ion and magnesium is not ammonium. So it does not change the fact that phosphate, this phosphate compound is insoluble, which means that when it's put into water, it will be a solid, it will not dissolve. If instead I wanted to look at a different compound, like say lithium bromide, I'm going to look up the lithium and the bromide both in the first columns. I find lithium right away and bromide right away, both in places that usually form soluble compounds. Now, lithium is soluble with no exceptions, which means that it's soluble in any compound. And bromide is soluble as long as it's not with silver, lead, two, or dimercury, and brom bromide is not with one of those. So this will be an aqueous substance because it is soluble. Soluble means aqueous when put in water. The last table we'll look at right now is table G. And table G gives us our solubility curves. And it is a chart that tells us the solubility of these substances based on a 100 gram sample of water. So for each of these amounts, we're putting it in 100 grams of water. If we're not using 100 grams of water, we'd need to adjust our numbers. So again, this is per 100 grams of water. If it's 200 grams of water, you need to double the amount on the chart. 300 grams of water, you would triple the amount on the chart. We can see that we have some lines that have a positive slope and some lines that have a negative slope. The lines that have the positive slopes are going to be our solids. And our solids, remember, get more soluble as we increase the temperature. Solids tend to be more soluble at higher temperature. And our gases are the ones that are sloping down because gases tend to become less soluble at higher temperature. Gases also would be, um, they'd be more soluble at low temperature and high pressure. Although this chart has nothing to do with pressure, we could also increase the solubility of a gas by increasing the pressure. The way that we're gonna use this chart is that we're going to figure out what substance we're talking about. And I usually like to highlight the substance. So for example, they said sodium nitrate, I would highlight my sodium nitrate. And if they said that we were putting an amount of sodium nitrate in 100 grams of water, we could use this chart directly. Let's say, for example, that we are looking at this sodium nitrate solution at 30 degrees Celsius, and we're putting about maybe 97 grams of sodium nitrate in 100 grams of water at 30 degrees Celsius. That would mean that we're talking about a saturated solution because it's on the line. The amount where we intersect the grams and the temperature are on the line for sodium nitrate's curve, so we call that a saturated solution. That means that the solution is in equilibrium, the rate of dissolving is equal to the rate of crystallization, and if more sodium nitrate is added, it'll all just fall to the bottom. No more sodium nitrate can be dissolved. If instead of adding 97 grams of sodium nitrate at this temperature, maybe we add 80 grams of sodium nitrate at this temperature, still at 30 degrees Celsius. Notice this is less than what would be saturated in 100 grams of water. This now is less than what we can put in as a maximum. So this would be an unsaturated solution it would all dissolve and we could still get more to dissolve. We could add those extra 17 grams at this temperature and they would all dissolve.
if instead of adding 80 grams at this 30 degrees Celsius temperature, if instead, let me just get rid of this. If instead we went now to 50 degrees Celsius and added about 116 grams of sodium nitrate and 100 grams of water, and we took this 50 degrees Celsius and we cooled it very slowly and we cooled it until we reached, let's say, 40 degrees Celsius. But none of the extra grams precipitate out. So at 40 degrees Celsius, we should only be able to have about 105. But if these 116 grams are still dissolved at 40 degrees Celsius because we cooled it very slowly, this would be called a supersaturated solution. The amount that's dissolved is more than should be able to be dissolved, and it is only achieved by heating it up, dissolving it, and cooling it very slowly. This supersaturated solution, we can get all of the extra grams to precipitate out or fall out of solution if we add what's called a seed crystal. It would all come out rapidly, or sometimes in some cases we can even shake the solution and that will cause all of the extra to precipitate out. It's a very unstable situation and it must be achieved by heating it up, getting the extra to dissolve, and then cooling it slowly. That's how you make a super saturated solution. So this is tables A through G. Hopefully this was helpful in terms of illustrating some of these tables. I'll be making some more videos on the rest of the reference tables and good luck studying.